Please stand. to the multitude. 
to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obey it not his voice. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high. And on earth peace, good will toward men. We praise Thee, we bless Thee, we worship Thee, we glorify Thee, we give thanks to Thee for Thy great glory, O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For Thou only art holy, Thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high. In the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Grant we beseech thee, merciful Lord, to thy faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve thee with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. reading from the Apostle St. Paul to the Romans, the 11th chapter. I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. 
For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their obedience. Even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. The word of the Lord. The eyes have all wait upon thee, O Lord, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou Last of all, he sent unto them his 
song singing. They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husband men? They said unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard to other husband men, which shall render him the fruits in their season. Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? With these questions, the chief priests and elders confront Jesus. And it is in response to these questions that Jesus now tells the parables in our text. By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? There is, I think, a profound desperation expressed by the chief priests and elders in these questions. These questions certainly contain a significant admission, namely that Jesus is indeed doing miraculous things, unprecedented things, things that cannot be done except by divine authority. Jesus' works cannot simply be disregarded as fake news. Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, the authority of Jesus has become a significant issue. From the beginning of his ministry, Jesus has shown remarkable authority. Authority to teach the law, to heal diseases, to calm the wind and the waves. Authority to cast out demons. Authority over the Sabbath. Authority even to forgive sins and to raise the dead. Indeed, I think Jesus has demonstrated more than mere authority. Authority typically has its limits. Slaves and servants, ambassadors can all wield authority by the command of their masters and their lords. Yet such authority is typically limited in its scope and application. One servant might have authority to buy and sell, Another servant to fight wars, another still to negotiate with foreign powers. But Jesus' authority it appears to have no limit, no boundaries. Throughout Matthew's Gospel, it becomes evident that Jesus does not merely have authority. He embodies freedom. A freedom in relation to the law, the Sabbath and its traditions. A freedom regarding diseases and the flesh of man. A freedom in relation to the forces of nature. A freedom impervious to demons and the power of temptation. A freedom even in relation to sin and death. To this point in Matthew's Gospel, the religious authorities have found no way to control or limit Jesus' freedom. The Pharisees have tried to regulate his freedom by means of the law, the Sabbath, its traditions. They even propose a most outlandish claim that Beelzebul is in fact the source of Jesus' power. The chief priests, for their part, have sought to bring Jesus' freedom into submission to the temple. In Matthew 17, the chief priests strategically send a tax collector to demand that Jesus pay the temple tax. Jesus does indeed pay the tax, but in a way that again demonstrates his boundless freedom. Catching a, a fish on a hook and pulling from its mouth a shekel, Jesus shows that he will not be snared by their clever traps. And then he simply asserts, the sons are free. And now on the occasion of our text, the clash between Jesus' freedom and the temple authorities is reaching its breaking point. Jesus has entered Jerusalem surrounded by royal acclamations, Hosanna to the Son of David. He then enters the temple, immediately drives out the money changers, and refers to the temple as my house. And if this were not enough, Jesus then even takes up residence in the temple, entertains the blind and the lame, heals their diseases, rejoices in the children's choir, proclaiming him the son of David. Indeed, dear friends, imagine your own reaction. If upon entering your sanctuary, you found a stranger now ministering to your people, you would be indignant, and rightly so, and so the chief priests too are outraged 
And so when they now see Jesus teaching in the temple for a second day, they have had enough. And so they confront Jesus. By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? These questions do not proceed from some idle curiosity or an academic interest or some political calculation. These questions proceed from desperation. They express a growing anxiety, but most of all, these questions are rooted in a deep-seated fear. Indeed, the chief priests give explicit testimony to their fear. For when Jesus challenges them with his own question concerning the authority of John and his baptism, the chief priests are unable to answer. And yet they give no answer, not because it is too difficult intellectually. They give no answer because as they themselves admit, they are afraid of the crowd. By what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? The two parables in our text are Jesus' response to these questions, but perhaps more specifically, they are Jesus' response to fear. The chief priests are afraid. They fear the crowds. They fear Roman armies. They fear Jesus. They fear that his works will bring the destruction of Jerusalem. But most of all, they fear their own loss of authority, the loss of their power, their wealth, their prestige even perhaps their own lives. In response, Jesus now tells two parables. These two parables are inseparable, and together these parables demonstrate the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of Jesus' freedom. The freedom that belongs only to the Son. You see, slaves serve out of fear. The fear of punishment. Hired servants do their duty out of the hope of reward. Ambassadors represent their masters desiring an increase in prestige and personal reputation. All of these act out of self-interest. But in this first parable, the father now comes to two sons with the very same invitation. Son, go and work in the vineyard today. Notice here that in this invitation, there is no threat of punishment that would motivate a slave. There is no hope of reward to motivate a hired servant. There is no promise of personal promotion that might appeal to an ambassador. Indeed, there is nothing here but the simple call of a father to his son. Perhaps this is why the second son verbally agrees to go, but then does not follow through. When he recognizes that there is no threat, no reward, no promise, nothing to appeal to his self-interest, he sees no reason to act. This man may be a slave or a servant or something more, but he does not act like a true son. The true son acts out of love for his father. And unlike fear or greed or self-interest, love always takes the form of freedom. Indeed, notice the freedom of this first son. First, he expresses a remarkable freedom by responding to his father's invitation by saying, I do not desire it. He freely, honestly expresses his own heart, his own desire, right before his father's face. No slave, no hired servant would be so bold. However, the first son then expresses his freedom to an even greater degree. The text says, but afterward, he thought better of it and departed into the vineyard. Here we see not only the height of his freedom, but also the profound depth of his freedom. The height of his freedom is seen in the honest, passionate response, I do not desire it. But now we see the depth of his freedom, a freedom that takes the form of self-denial. In this son's love, there is the freedom now to reject his own will and to do his father's will. The freedom to reject his desire for self-preservation, 
to repudiate his desire for reward, to forsake his desire for personal glory and reputation. In his love, there is therefore the freedom to deny himself, to take up his cross, and to follow the will of his Father. In the second parable, we see also, I think, the length and the breadth of the Son's freedom. In the first parable, we heard the Father's simple invitation, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. But now in the second parable, we see the task, the work, the duty the Father desires of his Son. And what is this task? Nothing other than laying down his own life. The parable tells us that as the harvest came, the servants were sent to collect the fruit. These servants were beaten and killed and stoned. Thus, when the father now calls the son to work in his vineyard, there is no doubt of what is being asked of the son. The son knows his life is on the line. No wonder the second son, while agreeing initially to go into the vineyard, now refuses. His self-interest will not allow it. Fear, greed, self-interest, these may indeed motivate a man to work and to plant and to prune and even to harvest. But they will not allow him to give up his own life. Such men are constrained. They are even enslaved enslaved and limited by their own desires, their own will to preserve their own lives. Here we see now, therefore, the full length of the Son's freedom. In His love for the Father, there is the freedom not merely to express His will, not merely to deny Himself, but even the freedom to give up His own life. And yet, dear friends, how can such a freedom truly be? Where does it come from? To be sure, the Son's freedom originates in His love for His Father. Yet this freedom, I think, draws its strength from the Son's intimate understanding of His Father's will. The Son knows His Father's plan. He knows His Father's purpose. He knows the end for which the Father sends Him into the vineyard. He is confident in the inheritance that now awaits Him. And so Jesus concludes, Have you never read in the Scriptures the very stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. In the bold expression of His desire, we saw the height of the Son's freedom. In His self-denial, we saw the depth of His freedom. In His voluntary death, we saw the length of His freedom. But now, in his hope for the resurrection and the glory of his Father, we see the full breadth of his freedom. The Son knows that his fulfillment is in his Father. His inheritance, therefore, is not limited to this world, but spreads out into the boundless horizons of the resurrection and the life of the world to come. It is the firm and certain hope of the resurrection that now gives the Son the freedom to deny Himself, the freedom to take up His cross, the freedom to lose His own life. And so in these two parables we see the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of Jesus' freedom. His freedom does not merely include a freedom in relation to the law or a freedom over demons, disease, and the forces of nature, even a freedom in relation to the temple and its authorities. Rather, his freedom is truly limitless, without boundary or constraint, a freedom, therefore, even to bear our sin, to endure death, to trample down all the power of the enemy. In other words, a freedom from all fear. Perfect love, writes St. John, casts out fear. Dear friends, you too are not merely called to be slaves or servants or even ambassadors. You are the children of God. 
And to you is now given, even at this altar, not merely authority, but freedom. The freedom of the Son Himself. And if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. To Christ be all the glory forever and ever. Create in me a
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. <clears throat> Almighty and everlasting God, who has revealed thy glory to all nations in Jesus Christ and in the word of his truth, keep, we beseech thee, in safety the works of thy mercy, so that thy church, spread throughout all nations, may be defended against the adversary, and may serve thee in true faith, and persevere in the confession of thy name. Lord, in thy mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray for all who are afflicted, especially Ezra Eckhart and those we name in our hearts. Almighty and everlasting God, the consolation of the sorrowful and the strength of them that labor. May the prayers of those who in any tribulation or distress cry to thee graciously come before thee, so that in all their necessities they may rejoice in thy manifold help and comfort. Lord, in thy mercy. Let us pray for ourselves. O Father Almighty, who didst create and dost uphold all things, bless us and all the fruits of the earth and the things that pertain to our need, that Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith, we may be truly thankful. Lord, in thy mercy. Let us remember the blessed dead and pray for those who mourn the passing of Norman Nagel, doctor of the faith. We remember before thee also all the faithful departed, especially thy servant Norman, giving thee thanks for the gift of life and eternal rest in thee. Comfort the survivors who mourn his death with the hope of the glorious resurrection and a happy reunion in heaven. Lead us all to remember that we are mortal so that we will ever prepare our hearts to fall asleep in faith and finally receive the glory promised to all who trust in thee. We remember before thee also all thy saints, the Blessed Virgin Mary, all the apostles and martyrs, and all the faithful departed, giving thee thanks for the gift of life and eternal rest in thee. Into thy hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in thy mercy, through thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee O Lord Holy Father Almighty everlasting God through Jesus Christ our Lord therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and singing. Oh, 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 oh,
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. taketh away the sin of the world.
in the sacrament. And we beseech thee not to forsake thy children, but evermore to rule our hearts and minds by thy Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve thee. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. countenance upon thee and give thee peace. 